All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining so early in the morning. Um, hope you guys had all your fun at the parties last night. <laughs> um, my name is Sean Murakami. Um, I'm with IBM's cloud performance team, part of the software group strategy division. And this is Phil Lestes. He's a senior technical staff member with IBM in our group as well. So just to start off, um, just want to see how many of you or your customers are using either legacy systems or have applications using legacy systems uh, backends for your applications. Good, it's about half of you guys. So today we're really going to talk to you about um, OpenStack and how the OpenStack can be used to leverage um, other platforms and not just only x86. So when we think about our journey through our OpenStack progression, when we start, start off, we're really looking at single node configurations and this journey through a distributed platform. How many of you are new to OpenStack and just getting started? All good. So when we start off, we really start looking at what OpenStack features have to offer, what OpenStack's really about. Uh, in my experience, about a little over two years ago, uh, when IBM helped start the uh, OpenStack Foundation, I was asked to go take a look at OpenStack, figure out what it is, and then within the next couple of weeks, we might actually <laughs> need to talk to a customer about it. So um, but the way I got started learning about OpenStack is you know, starting off with a single node configuration, leverage tools such as DevStack. Um, if, you if you don't know what a DevStack is, you should really go check it out. It's, it's really what a lot of developers use in the de in developer community to unit test their environment. And it's a, a good tool to help you just to get the wheels going uh, and to learn about OpenStack and actually get it installed relatively quickly. So the next step in the, our OpenStack journey is really to look at multi-node deployments. And what I mean by multi-node deployments is when you start off with a single typically a single controller node, and you're really looking to scale out your compute nodes, really trying to understand and re run real workloads against OpenStack. Um, this is where I, I learned a lot myself um, about the features and functions about OpenStack, because this is really when you get into the guts of the configurations and trying to learn the ins and outs of what works for you and your applications. <coughs> And this is also where you learn all, all the pitfalls and, and some of the good things that OpenStack has to offer. But um, this is really when you start looking at uh, whether if it's managing multiple compute nodes or what hypervisors work best with your applications. Continuing on the journey, uh, we look at finally distributed deployments. And this is really when we start to look at um, moving your applications to more of a production or um, high availability environment to make sh ensure that your applications can sustain, <coughs> sorry, your OpenStack deployment can sustain your application workloads. Um, this is also when you start to think about how to automate your OpenStack deployment to make these things repeatable and reliable. A lot of things we've been working on recently have been in this area around high availability. Uh, we gave a talk last year in Atlanta about this, and uh, at this summit we started expanding on our high availability thinking by leveraging Docker to um, run in these scenarios. So what, what concepts does OpenStack provide you to manage these distributed um, and multi-node deployments. So OpenStack provides you a couple of uh, capabilities within its uh, no Nova configurations. We look at these four constructs. So the first two are really API level um, logical groupings of how you can split out your environment. So when we look at cells, uh, we heard a little, about, a little bit in the uh, keynotes about some of the customers using cells to uh, arrange different scheduling groups within a single OpenStack re uh, region. And when we talk about regions, it's really a way for us to segregate multiple OpenStack deployments. So typically, uh, our customers would use regions to define OpenStack deployments either geographically or between different data centers. 
The next two, availability zones and host aggregates, are really breakdowns at the physical level of the OpenStack deployment. Um, first, I'll kind of go over host aggregates. So host aggregates is a grouping that you can put in your Nova config where um, you can really define or group like systems. So for example, if you have a set of uh, physical nodes that have a certain RAID configuration that's more applicable to your, uh, perhaps you, you want to use for your database applications, we can break those up into those house aggregates. And availability zones are breakups of um, groups of systems. Typically, you would break them up either between racks or uh, a group of racks. And this is really where we start looking at um, how we want to deploy our applications into those nodes to sustain the high availability at the application or workload levels. So this picture kind of gives you an overview of the, those four concepts I just talked about. So at the biggest level, we have in the boxes regions. Um, these could be, again, in different data centers or across different geographies. Within the data center or within the region, we can have a group of compute nodes, which we can classify as cells. So these can have different scheduling policies. Further breakdown, um, within each rack, we can define these as availability zones. And across racks, you could have host aggregates. So we might have different sets of um, high I.O. compute nodes uh, set up in across racks. I, th I think one of the things we, uh, again, it's early in the morning. We're trying to keep you guys awake. Um, <laughs> before we just you know, go on, um, it was maybe of interest to, to figure out who's, who's kind of a, at this level of deployment uh, with OpenStack. Uh, is there anyone here who's, who's uh, at that level of multi-node or distributed uh, deployments with your customers? Great. Uh, what, if anyone's willing, what industries or, or segment uh, are you operating in? Telecom? Telecom? Finance, anyone? Telecom. Telecom. Okay. Yeah, great. So I, I think we're really looking at, okay, what's next in your multi Um So this is where we're going to really look into and dive into potentially multiple platforms and why you know, we need OpenStack to actually work on these other architecture environments. So I'll hand it over to Phil. All right. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of going to leave some of those uh, concepts that, sh that Sean talked about, um, some of the OpenStack segregation concepts, and, and focus for a few minutes on uh, platforms. Um, you know, obviously, uh, we can start talking about, um, you know, I think the, the most common platform in use in OpenStack is obviously the x86 uh, architecture. Um, you know, Gartner and others have mentioned that, uh, you know, in the, in the last few years of cloud, uh, more than 50% of all traditional workloads uh, have been virtualized, put in the cloud. Um, and, and even, you know, before we even leave x86, uh, there's obviously a, already a multi-compute um, set of, of capabilities on x86. Um, you know, officially, uh, OpenStack supports uh, all these hypervisors, KVM, Zen, Hyper-V, VMware. And uh, I don't know if anyone caught uh, Eric Windish's talk yesterday. The Nova Docker driver uh, is currently out of tree, but it's, it's there and people are using it. Um, um, so, you know, x86 is, is definitely um, the most common platform in use. Uh, but, you know, so, there, so maybe it begs the question, why do we need other architectures uh, in the cloud? You know, could we migrate these traditional workloads to, to x86 um, and, and continue on this path? And, uh, you know, I think um, from an IBM perspective, uh, from what our customers are telling us, um, you know, we definitely, um, you know, need those traditional architectures. And one picture we like to use to, uh, to help explain that is really thinking of um, customer uh, 
architecture is really put in two major buckets. So one we're calling system of, of record and the other system of engagement. What we, what we use those terms for is if you think of, of the back office, the uh, traditional IT s systems uh, in an enterprise, many of those are uh, on, uh, you know, especially when we're talking about large enterprise, uh, on mainframes, uh, and then, you know, looking at systems of engagement, that's more the mobile, uh, the, the emerging spaces. This is where a lot of the activity around DevOps, uh, continuous integration. And so there, in a sense, uh, there are two different worlds here operating in the enterprise, and, and both are critical. Uh, obviously, much of the, much of the data, um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's uh, other traditional back-end uh, operations, uh, we need to find a way to to integrate these two worlds, and one of the ways that uh, that that needs to happen is to to not you know remove these systems of record, but find a way to bring uh, the innovation of the systems engagement uh, to that world. Um, so let's just talk about uh, what architectures are available um, in OpenStack today beyond x86. Uh, and, then, and then we'll dive into a, a little bit of detail. Um, I believe uh, today these are the three non-x86 architectures that have uh, OpenStack drivers. Uh, we'll talk briefly about ARM. Uh, personally, um, I don't believe IBM has a lot of activity in the space, but obviously our power and Z systems um, are traditional uh, hardware platforms that many of our our customers are using. Um, if you look uh, at ARM, uh, Canonical has added 64-bit um, ARM support uh, to Ubuntu uh, with uh, KVM hypervisor support. And so, uh, you know, again, I, um, I don't have uh, a lot of experience in this area, but uh, while microservers are kind of a new trend, um, they definitely uh, can hold promise in the area of uh, low energy, uh, reduction of space requirements, and uh, you know, media serving and other potential uses uh, do exist. And uh, so we'll see, see what happens with ARM and, and microservers. Um, you know, there, there are significant growth rates predicted in the area of microservers, uh, and support is there uh, today. I don't know if anyone has heard of TriStack. Um, that's another way to, to uh, you know, potentially start to learn about OpenStack. If you go to tristack.org, uh, I know at one point they were offering um, ARM servers in their pool that you could try out. So you can check that out. So moving on to uh, one of IBM's tr uh, traditional uh, server platforms, uh, there have been some fairly significant announcements uh, this year around power. Um, and we're, <laughs> we're going to get reconnected. Um, we'll just... All right, so um, as, I, as I mentioned, there's a couple things uh, we should talk about here. Uh, one being that, um, you know, Power has had a long history of virtualization uh, well before OpenStack, uh, the Power VM uh, hypervisor in its current uh, implementation has been around for a number of years, at least uh, prior to, to KVM. Uh, but hypervisor technology on Power uh, dates uh, well back, uh, you know, a decade before that. Um, so we'll talk, we'll talk uh, briefly about PowerVM, but then this year we announced uh, in April uh, Power KVM, and also Little Endian support uh, was added to Ubuntu's uh, distribution. So 14.04 um, has Power KVM capability, and we also have our traditional RHEL and Celeste distro uh, support. So, you know, on Power Today, that means you have uh, two hypervisor options, Power VM, and then the Power KVM that was announced this year. And then it's, it's worth mentioning that, uh, 
In addition here, we're bringing Docker to power. Uh, that work has already started in the upstream communities. And so that, that will be available in the future as well. Um, you know, one, one of the traditional uh, areas that power is used, uh, how many have heard of Watson, our cognitive computing um, com supercomputer? Uh, that runs on the power architecture. And, uh, you know, a lot of the traditional power um, features, the memory architecture, has been a perfect fit for, for big data and analytics. Um, and there's also a, a, a traditional install base around ERP and CRM applications. Um, so let, let's move to, to System Z. Um, how many have, have heard of System Z? Or know, know what I mean when I'm saying that? So that is IBM's traditional mainframe platform, uh, which was supposed to die many, many years ago, but has lived on. Um, again, when you look at uh, Z from a virtualization perspective, um, even prior to the naming of ZVM, um, there has been virtualization capabilities on Z even back to the 1970s, uh, but officially the ZVM uh, LPAR variant of that has been around since uh, 1987. So, um, you know, we're going to talk through uh, what the capabilities are around that, but, um, you know, Traditional Z workloads have been around for a very long time, and a very uh, significant percentage of, of uh, global financial and, and enterprise data lives on Z today. Um, you know, one, one uh, mention here, um, you know, Visa has been relying on System Z for transactional processing, you know, reaching very, very high rates of, of transactions per second, especially in the holiday season. So, you know, their ability to have um, that kind of workload on Z is critical to their business. Uh, and yet, you know, that's a another pointer that, that we can't ignore Z as a participant in cloud. Um, again, briefly looking at the hypervisor uh, offerings, uh, ZVM is there today, traditional uh, LPAR support. Um, if you look upstream, You'll already see IBM working uh, to bring ZKVM, which is KVM and the libvirt and uh, QMU components to Z. Um, and again, at this point, that's upstream work uh, that's happening. And then uh, in addition, uh, there is the uh, attempt to bring Docker to System Z as well, along with the work we're doing on power. Um, so we'll have a... Yes. Um, we can take a question now. <coughs> yes. Yeah. So, so in a couple of charts, we're going to look at. Uh, again, we're not talking about uh, bringing these transactional sy systems to the cloud, but moving cloud workloads, these systems of engagement, to the data. And we'll show why that's valuable. Um, so that we're not talking about running these traditional workloads as cloud workloads, but getting cloud workloads like the web serving near the data and why that's valuable because of the, the transactional needs that we can't separate that and expect to get the same throughput, you know, between those those systems. So yeah, let, let's let's move along, and uh, maybe maybe it'll become clearer uh, as we describe, um, you know, some of the Z features. Uh, again, you know, our traditional mainframe strengths uh, have been around uh, the performance, availability, and security of these systems. Um, again, you know, based in many um, significant technologies dating well into the 60s and 70s that have been iterated and, and continued to be improved uh, into the modern era. Um, but given that they started with the design points of being extremely scalable, 
um, sharing uh, a share everything uh, model with extremely high speed networks uh, within the system uh, and full CPU and memory memory sharing. Um, you know, we'll talk, we'll look at a uh, consolidation example that shows um, you know rates of of 30 to one moving from uh, you know sort of commodity systems to to system Z. Um, you know, availability. So so SLAs, uh, the compliance rates for system Z are uh, you know amazing when you look at it on a graph compared to other architectures. Um, you know, and and with our our bringing Linux to this platform, um, you know a lot of these these components and capabilities are exposed up to the Linux layer, offering some of these same features of the platform within Z Linux. Uh, security is obviously a uh, a hot topic um, in, in servers and cloud specifically, and the again the design of this traditional uh, hypervisor. Uh, has very um, significant isolation um, uh, guarantees, and and because of our traditional um, strengths here, has you know significant logging, monitoring, auditing capabilities that have been in the system for decades. Um, so again, with our enterprise customers, we're finding that their uh, performance and availability needs require bringing these cloud components to the Z system um, to handle the extreme throughput uh, requirements that they've already had in their system of record um, transactional systems. So here's just a, a, a fairly simple example of a web server um, running separately on a, on a Linux server connected to DB2 on ZOS. Um, bringing that to where they're both co-located within the system Z with the web serving and the DB2 um, in separate LPARs but within the same server. So Z Linux and a ZOS image uh, both connected internally. You can see that the you know transactions per second um, have a huge performance increase. Much of that due again to the internal connectivity, the IO channels, uh, within the System Z um, ecosystem, allowing for for much more um, significant throughput, and you know this is one example. Um, we have quite a few uh, studies that have been done, and much more data around uh, the transactional capabilities of co-locating uh, within the Z server. And then uh, you know and a few other. Examples around um, consolidation. So a couple clients have done consolidation onto Z uh, from x86. Uh, you can see um, that again, increase of, of data center needs, complexity increasing, uh, the, the support, the licensing, the maintenance of those systems. Um, uh, therefore impacting their ability to uh, to service customer needs, the time to deploy new racks, new systems. And so both uh, Nationwide Insurance and Baldor have uh, consolidated onto a System Z and uh, you know SAP DB2 applications running both Z Linux, ZOS, ZVM. And you know some of the numbers here uh, that they found, uh, energy costs were reduced greatly uh, Baldor noted a significant reduction in data center space requirements. And then obviously, due to the consolidation, a lowering of administration and maintenance costs uh, for those servers. So again, you know, some of the, the benefits both of, of the System Z architecture, its capabilities, uh, combined with the benefits of consolidation, um, you know, hopefully, even with this brief overview, you can see that um, you know there's a great value to keeping Z in the ecosystem and combining that with with uh, systems of engagement uh, workloads. So we're going to talk a little about 
a little bit about what it looks like today to bring uh, Z into OpenStack. Then we'll talk about um, where things are heading. And then we'll look at that uh, for power as well. So today, um, mostly because of some historic reasons of how IBM uh, started with cloud on Z, and especially with Linux vir virtualization, we end up with a, uh, a region uh, for Z using an x86 compute node that's a proxy to XCAT, which is another open source project that IBM developed uh, historically for doing cloud administration. And uh, that, the XCAT tool is what actually is deploying uh, Z Linux LPARs onto uh, the system Z through your compute proxy. And so basically today, using ZVM for Linux, that you'll have to have a region uh, per LPAR proxying your OpenStack APIs, the Nova APIs, uh, through that to the system Z. That will you know, communicate through XCAT to actually uh, schedule and provision images onto uh, the Z mainframe. Now, as I mentioned, um, we are bringing uh, KVM uh, currently in the upstream communities uh, to Z Linux. And therefore, the hope would be in the future that you have standard Nova libvirt KVM pathways to deploy Z Linux onto the system Z um, ecosystem. Similarly, power, uh, we mentioned, um, we mentioned that there's Power VM as an option for hypervisor, and that uh, Power KVM was announced this year. So again, uh, similar but, but slightly different pathways. Um, with Power VM, you have to use the Power VM driver and uh, the IVM uh, virtualization manager that's built into the Power platform. Uh, with Power VM, you're going to have the ability to both run traditional AIX and system I uh, instances as well as Linux. Um, but with Power KVM, um, there won't be support for HMCs for those that use the hardware management controller. Uh, but that takes IVM out of the picture and you're, you're talking directly to KVM. Again, that's st standard Nova to libvirt to KVM path. But that also removes the ability to have AIX or, or the traditional system I uh, OS images involved. So those are the two options, Power VM, Power KVM. Uh, Power KVM obviously aligned with Power 8 and uh, some of the canonical announcements around that that I, that I mentioned. So, you know, what next? If, uh, if you haven't been uh, in these ecosystems of Power System Z, um, there's a couple options to learn more. Um, you can come, come talk to anyone at the IBM booth. There's a Power 8 system there. Uh, you can check out a Power 8 server. You can talk uh, to folks there who have expertise. Um, we also have some OpenStack offerings uh, from IBM, obviously we have upstreamed um, the capabilities that we've talked about, but we also have our own um, cloud manager with OpenStack and our IBM Cloud Orchestrator products that already fully support managing uh, Z and Power architectures. And then also um, some places to, to uh, try out uh, Z and Power, um, the IBM hosted Orchestrator Beta and then uh, yesterday I was talking to someone from Canonical who pointed at uh, Run Above has Power8 servers in their cloud. And so you can uh, access a fully OpenStack uh, capable uh, power compute resource through Run Above. And earlier this year, uh, we announced that SoftLayer would also be um, offering power compute. And if you've seen the recent announcements of the IBM Watson services, uh, that's running on power in software today, and that should be exposed uh, as well in the future to other customers. 
Um, if you already uh, have Power Z hardware, a few uh, notes about what's required uh, to be using OpenSAC, using KVM, or the tradi traditional uh, hypervisors. Uh, this list of Z Enterprise systems are what's available today. Uh, it does require ZVM 6.3 or greater. Um, so if you have significantly older Z hardware or older ZVM releases, uh, OpenStack uh, won't be uh, viable there. Um, Power VM requires Power 7 or Power 8 uh, with the uh, virtualization manager. Uh, Power KVM requires um, the newer Power 8 servers that were announced, uh, but does support uh, RHEL 7 Big Endian, SLES 12 Little Endian, and the two latest Ubuntu releases as Little Endian. And as I mentioned, uh, with Power KVM, there isn't support uh, for the hardware management console. Um, these, these slides will be available online. Uh, uh, there, there's a link there which uh, will take you to um, IBM's offering center for Linux on Power and Z and lots of uh, detailed guides and configuration uh, information is available there. Most of the IBM sessions um, uh, have come and gone, given we're on Wednesday. There are a few more. Uh, if, you're, um, if you were sharp-eyed, you saw that our, our uh, description of our talk uh, mentioned Federated uh, Keystone, uh, which we weren't able to, uh, to integrate. But the experts are talking at 11.50 today, uh, some of the folks who were very involved in the development of that capability in Keystone. Um, so that, that's available there. And then directly after this, and through the through early afternoon, um, the IBM uh, track sessions are available uh, with, again, directly after this, uh, next door there'll be a more detailed talk about um, all of our cloud offerings, which will cover, obviously, the manageability of power and Z. So with that, um, any questions, anything that, uh, that we didn't cover that you thought we would, or um, other interesting questions? I I lost the last part of that. There's, I think there's a mic. Yeah, you said that uh, you were bringing uh, KVM or set K KVM to uh, uh, Linux on uh, System C. Is there a benefit to using KVM inside Linux on System C compared to just spinning up a new uh, Linux instance on System C? Yeah. So so as I mentioned, I, th I think one of the the major benefits will be uh, having the the sort of traditional Nova driver through libvirt uh, capability rather than the current XCAT having to create a region that talks to x86, the proxies through XCAT. Um, I think as we get into next year, uh, there'll be more information about, you know, what pros and cons of, of ZKVM versus traditional uh, ZVM LPARs. Yes. Uh, 
to bring blue jean. Oh, blue jean. I don't I don't know have an answer for that, but I know some of the blue jean folks, so we could tee that up if you want to catch me afterward. Right. Right. All right. We have a couple minutes. If there's anything else, otherwise, you know, feel free to catch us at the IBM booth or uh, after the talk. Thanks very much. Thank you.